Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar by Smart Karma. I'm Michael Tegos. Today, we continue with uh, analyst Kyle Rudden's ESG webinar series in collaboration with SGX. In this fifth installment, uh, Kyle will pick up where the last session left off, delving deeper into topics covered in the section called Hacking for Data. Uh, Kyle, welcome back. Great to have you with us once again, uh, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you again for participating. Um, this is the fifth now in a series on ESG-related investing, uh, this one being on ESG data. As Michael said, kind of a continuation of the last webinar. I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, but first, just a quick introduction, and then we'll get going. For those of you who haven't participated in prior webinars, my name is Kyle Rudden. I've been covering sustainability and ESG-related investing uh, on the Smart Karma platform since 2019. Prior to that, I was involved in various aspects of ESG-related investing, predominantly investment research and um, equity index development. Um, in total, probably about 13 years now, maybe a little bit more, probably closer to 14, dedicated to ESG-related investment research. Before that, although I covered ESG-related issues, we didn't use the vernacular back then. I was in a more traditional investment research role um, mainly as a uh, sell side equity analyst, head of JP Morgan's global energy research group. As far as the agenda goes, as I said before, this is sort of an extension of, of the last webinar. And what happened was, you know, last webinar was on ESG data also. It's a little heavy on theory, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, common problems, challenges with ESG data and data drive products, that sort of thing. Um, especially one size fits all products, scores, ratings, that kind of thing. At the, at the very end of the last webinar, um, I kind of mentioned almost in passing a, a trend, you know, institutional investors doing more of, of the um, ESG research in-house, relying less and less on those high level scores, ratings, et cetera, and so forth. I, it was almost in passing. And then I, I followed that up with one slide at the end that was just kind of about, you know, kind of hacking around for data, ESG data. And I got a lot of positive feedback on it. I was surprised by how much. And in hindsight, I wish I spent more time on some of those topics. I'm going to start off with just kind of gen general ESG G data and scores, but not the big third-party providers, not the MFCIs and, and S&Ps and Refinitives of the world. I'm gonna go over one in particular, but a few, um, I wanna be careful of the word alternative. It's not alternative data necessarily, but alternative overall ESG sources, um, you know, scores, ratings, rankings, that kind of thing. The first one, ESG book. I don't know if you guys heard about it. Um, it's something I'm pretty excited about. Um, it's spear. It's a project that's spearheaded by Arabesque, which has been in ESG investing since, since I've been doing it almost 15 years. There are a lot of other partners involved, but Arabesque is the, the kind of spearhead of this. It's, it's a, call it open source. I mean, it's a technically open source, but it's like public domain ESG data. Their mission is to democratize ESG data and make it available for everybody, which is a relief. It's long overdue. We get detailed ESG scores on about 9,000, over 9,000 at this point, issuers globally, all the major index, index constituents and all the major markets around the world. Uh, it's real-time data with uh, historicals and ESG scores are based on our S-ray model. I would suggest Googling that, re reading up on it. It's basically a you know, quantitative model, it's real-time, a lot of machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, some 250, 250 plus metrics. Um, it's been, the the S-Ray has been around for a while. This product's fairly new. I think they launched it like three or four months ago. Uh, it's free, completely free to use. Just need to register, sign up. And it's very, very transparent. Well, they are very transparent with uh, regards to the methodology. So it's definitely worth checking out. And there's the API to this. And you can download data. You can do direct calls to the API. They have um, climate-related scores, you know, temperature scores. They've got uh, UN Global Compact scores, controversies and um, you know, a bunch of other data. And they've got all their disclosures, all their uh, reports, sustainability reports, and a lot of other things. It's, it's really useful, I'll, I'll check it out. Again, it's got most of the uh, listed issuers, significant list of issuers in the world and, and you know, constantly growing. A couple of the other ones that I mentioned in here that are, are interesting, and these are sort of all, they represent kind of a, a new trend. You know, companies that are, if, if you were on the last webinar, one of the, the shortcomings of ESG data that, that I mentioned is um, that source ESG data, ESG data that's reported by issuers is very static. It's not updated regularly. I mean, if you're lucky, you get updates, you know, once a quarter, 
um, from really progressive firms. It's usually once a year when the sustainability or ESG reports come out. And it tends to be backward looking. And in the past, third party products just kind of exacerbated that. The source data is kind of static and backward looking and a lot of the scores and, and rating systems were the same. It's improving, but there's this new, new breed of, of you know, ESG data company like ESG Book and some of these others that do pull in a lot of different alternative data sources. And it's a, it's a much more real time look at things. And, and you know, a lot of the big names like MACI can't do it. Um, not that they're incapable, they're quite capable, but just given the number of products that are linked to their data, there's just a whole you know, due diligence process. They, they really couldn't be changing their scores in real time. So these, these kinds of, of entities are in, in my view, sort of complementary to some of the big names. Ethos is also kind of public domain. Um, I use open source casually, it's public domain. It's a little bit more impact related. One of the earlier webinars, we, we addressed different kinds of materiality. Um, this is not financial materiality, this is um, kind of sustainability materiality, um, but it's still pretty interesting. Sensible is another one that I mentioned. There are um, pretty easy ways to download this data, the adjacent. And WikiRate is kind of the new one on the block. It's a crowdsource, if you will, you know, ESG sustainability and ESG database, it's, it's progressing pretty well. It's pretty big. It is a little bit complex uh, or difficult to use. There's a lear uh, learning curve, the API I'm talking about. It's a pretty significant learning curve, but it's worth checking out. It's a great way I've found to, for you know, a large number of companies to just kind of programmatically pull in a lot of emissions data. Again, it's, it, it's a little bit difficult to get used to, but it's definitely worth it once you, once you do. The next group, um, emissions related data. This is a big category. I, um, I tried to show some of the big ones, corporate emissions and kind of country level emissions. A couple to point out, net zero tracker. It's pretty useful. It's got a large database of companies. Take the scores and, and percentages for what they're worth, but what I find most useful is, again, it's, it's a one place, a consolidated central repository of a lot of emissions data, which is, is hard to come by. The other one I wanted to point out, the yeah, Science-Based Targets Initiative. You've probably heard it, heard of it. It's growing. Uh, there are about 2,000 or so, not really signatories, uh, members that have submitted science-based targets. It's a little weak or a little light in Asia Pacific, although that's changing. But the data is um, really substantive on these companies. It goes over their, um, uh, their net zero targets, but more than that, climate change related targets, you know, interim year, end year, you know, percentage cuts. It, it's, it's really substantive. Again, large number of companies that um, definitely worth taking a look at. Um, and then Climate Action 100 is another, um, cooperative initiative. And again, it's it's pretty substantive. It's a couple hundred companies. Um, but again, a lot of detailed information on um, emissions reduction targets, both uh, quantitative and qualitative. So also worth checking out. I'm not going to go over uh, a lot of the country level emissions data. You've seen one, you've seen them all for the most part. Um, environmental pillar energy. So here's a bunch of energy related databases, um, power plant databases, miscellaneous, various miscellaneous. Um, APAC Energy is really useful. I definitely check it out. There's a number of databases um, on uh, power plants. It's a great map, uh, includes a lot of emissions information, downloadable to up here. And there are a couple others a lot like this. Let's see, Carbon Brief, Coal Policy, is coal specific, but um, global coal plant database, same kind of thing. I mean, you can play around with the geographic information system, but all the data is downloadable and Carbon Brief has more than just coal policy. There's, uh, so there's a lot more data than just coal power plant database, but I put it in here uh, for that example. And this is the last one of power plants, the um, Global Energy Monitor. It also has a global coal plant tracker. I would go through this if you're interested because there's a ton of data in here. Again, all downloadable, it's all completely you know, free and public but definitely worth looking at. I'm not, this is a great database, uh, offshore wind plants. That's a great database. It's pretty significant, but I, the point here that I wanna make though is actually Figshare, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, is 
uh, just a super useful place to find data. So this what this basically is, is all the academics that write these journal articles about ESG and climate change and whatever, this is kind of like a, a, a hosting site for their figures, their data, et cetera, and so forth. A, a largely unknown outside of world of publishing, largely unknown source, but it's a massive database of just about everything, but there's a ton of climate and other ESG and sustainability related stuff in there. And it's all downloadable. There's a lot of really interesting um, data in terms of fossil fuel divestiture. There's, you know, financial institutions like banks, you know, uh, that are exiting coal or invest institutional investors, exiting coal developers, et cetera. So if you're into the, the coal, coal exit thing and uh, divestiture, that's a useful resource. Similarly, with global coal exit, that's a pretty well-known study. I would definitely look at those. Um, there's just a couple of interesting ones. Uh, the GEM Wiki, that, that again, that's the Global Energy Monitor, GEM. Uh, it's just a curated list of all their databases. And that um, QuiverQuant thing is pretty interesting too. It's, um, it's US only, but it's all kind of facility related uh, sources of, of uh, emissions. So not just power plants, but like industrial facilities, et cetera. There are also quite a few um, data sources on environmental climate change related policy and litigation, which is kind of what I want to spend more time talking about on the right. On the left, a lot of policy related databases, some of them are well, more well known than others. The uh, SUSREG tracker is uh, a new launch by the, um, by, by the producers of the sustainable uh, bank assessment. This is, um, this is the Southeast Asia one. It's, Basically, um, a pretty in-depth assessment of climate-related policies. This this page happens to be Southeast Asia page, but they assess um, policies around the world, um, so that's pretty useful. But there are the number of, of climate litigation databases, and the reason I bring that up is because climate, in particular, but generally ESG-related litigation, is on the rise. Um, there have been a number of major cases uh, in the press. One with Shell. One with uh, L'Oreal, and it's a ma for investors, it's a major area of risk, kind of an emergent area of risk. So I, I would definitely take a look at those. Some of them, there's some overlap between them, like the, um, the Columbia um, climate litigation uh, database feeds into a couple of the others, but th they're all useful in different ways. There, there are a bunch more that, that I felt were redundant, um, but those are worth looking at as well. There are some um, social and governance related um, links here, not, not as many as climate, but there are a few of them. There's some interesting things there. Corporate violation tracker is one of them. It's really interesting. It's a database of you know, mo most large companies in the world and, and you know, various fines and, and penalties. There's the Open Sanctions database, which is a massive database that pulls from a number of different databases that provides a lot of detail on, on um, so was sanctioned and and you know other otherwise restricted or banned um, corporations, government entities, individuals, et cetera, and so forth. The CEO dismissal database is a fun one. You know, it's just again, it's a database of, of corporate CEOs and and uh, their dismissals and, and reasons for the dismissals of some surprises in there, uh, and a few other governance related um, links uh, on the side. The, uh, by the way, the, under miscellaneous and other, that, that global cyber risk assessment, uh, it's done by um, uh, Belfer Center and I think Harvard University, and it's done uh, every year, and that's really worth looking at as well. Kind of moving on to what I mentioned in the beginning, the last webinar ended with a slide that I think the title was dorking for data or something like that, dorking being a um, sign phrase for just using Google advanced search queries to, to find stuff also goes by Google hacking. I'm gonna to get to that in a second, but first I wanted to point out something. I realized that a lot of the links I had up front were direct links or are direct links to data files, uh, like uh, JSON files. I mean, some of them are direct Excel downloads. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like direct links to JSON files or um, API URLs. And it occurred to me that uh, some of you might be well aware of this, but for those of you that aren't, you know, this is kind of a, um, a neat way of downloading data, uh, making it really simple. Um, it works for a lot of data data driven websites, not all of them. But it, you know, when you when you go to a website, you know, nine nine out of ten of them use XHR, which is just basically a JavaScript API, a JavaScript AJAX API that that you know delivers data from a server to a website. 
and, and most of the big um, ESG data and score providers are providing at least high level scores free these days. You go to a site like Refinitiv, you know, you search for a company, you get a page with ESG data and ESG scores. And, you know, while if you're good at scripting, you could write a script to, to scrape, you probably check the terms of service before you do that. But that data is delivered if you, uh, and if you open web developer tools, if you copy the URL, is the API URL for a direct download of JSON data. It's just delivered in data format, JSON format. And if you're not familiar with JSON, not comfortable with it, whatever, you can just save that file and then convert it. There are plenty of uh, online, free online conversion facilities. You just up- upload the file and you download uh, Excel or CSV. Um, there are a lot of sites like that. Um, for example, uh, Reuters, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you go to Reuters website and you can get a website with data, but you can also do a direct API request. Pretty much, not every website, but pretty much any website used to go to, used to go into that delivers data somehow uh, or some sort of data you should be able to do something like this. This is just um, ESG data for uh, ETFs. By the way, if you guys are, are at all into um, analyzing, you know, fund flows and that kind of thing, uh, ESG related, I would definitely check out Track Insight. It's um, free um, ETF database. It's got about 8,000 global uh, ETFs and again, you know, tons of uh, API functionality. The last thing that I want to address is some of the dorking stuff. I, I, I addressed some of this stuff on um, the last one, um, just I think what I did was say, I gave you examples of using um, some of the more common or popular operators like file type XLS, XLSX or file type PDF to kind of narrow a search or to find data that would either not show up or show up 20 pages down the search results if you were just doing a regular Google search. So, you know, for example, uh, something like, um, Southeast Asia carbon file type XLX will get you a lot of interesting stuff. Um, if you add the uh, string like um, ISIN or, or, or ticker or, or RIC or something, then you'll get a lot of stock data that's related to carbon and Southeast Asia. And you can, you can combine things. I, um, you could do file type XLSX comma file type CSV just to make sure you get everything. You can exclude uh, by putting a, a negative uh, in front of something. So, you know, if you search for ESG a site equals MSCI, you could put negative site or affinitive if you, if you want to exclude affinitive. So there's a lot of things you can do. The related operator is interesting. I mean, sometimes it produces um, kind of weird results, but sometimes really useful results. It just gives you a related site. You can really dig up some interesting stuff. Another example that I didn't have last time was enumerating subdomains. Um, there are other ways to do this with like penetration testing tools, uh, passive reconnaissance, but you can also do it with a Google search term. Um, there is, uh, there's a number of resources out there. I mean, you could always just, you could always just Google, Google hacking or Google uh, dorking. There's a ton of resources. But the Google hacking database, you know, has a, a count, uh, hundreds of thousands and thousands of, of examples. Uh, of, of various um, common, uh, you know, search combinations. And there are, are a lot more operators than just the ones I gave you. I mean, you can search for like in text or in URL. So if I did ESG in text, uh, uh, I'm telling it that, that ESG has to be in the text of the website. So it wouldn't give me something where ESG was just in the URL, but not the text. Uh, you can do it in URL, you can do it in title. There are all sorts of operators um, that look at it, and and you know if you I didn't I didn't want to push the boundary here, but if, if if you really dig, I mean there there are other file types. This is just a bad example. I shouldn't even do it. But like um, searching the envelope with DB password, you're probably going to get a lot of pat, exposed passwords. But th- there there are combinations like this that I don't want to say exposed because it's not exposing anything that shouldn't be exposed. The stuff's out there, and it's it's indexed by Google. Um, but it's bringing to the four, bringing up from like page 50 in the search results to the, to the top of the search results, like Excel files, um, database files, like DBF files and MySQL files, that kind of thing. If you 
you know, really, really set your mind to it and, and craft these, these um, constructors, you'll find data you, you didn't even know existed. And one other thing I wanted to point out, you know, as you're doing this stuff, it's, this is just, this is Google dorking. So you're using Google to search what Google has already indexed. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal about it. But if you're doing like data acquisition um, in mass or you do it programmatically, just you know, kind of keep a few things in mind. Always read the terms of service, kind of keeping yourself, your IP from, from getting banned. Generally, you know, kind of being a good uh, citizen, you know, reading robots.txt files, using APIs if they're available, rather than scraping, it's less resource intensive, putting timeouts and ran time randomizations in, and, you know, kind of composing those informative custom headers. It basically says, you know, I'm Jim Smith, I'm doing sustainability research, here's my email address kind of thing. And the last slide, um, just a bunch of additional useful data resources. Paris Agreement NDCs, that's really useful if you're at all following Paris Agreement and the nationally determined contributions of countries and, and decarbonization rates and that kind of thing. Um, and that Climate Scope API, I play around with that. By the way, Git, GitHub is a great source. In fact, going back to some of the Google dorking, that's something I do often, like uh, maybe carbon emissions site, github.com, you know, file type CSV. Uh, they tend to be CSVs on, on GitHub, not Excel files. Ton of data and information on GitHub. Another one is Kaggle. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It holds a lot of data science competitions. And as part of that, there are massive data sets. For example, uh, the entire carbon disclosure project, uh, data dump for everything, um, company reporting, cities, water, is on Kaggle. So that's another thing to look at. Kind of these just hidden hidden data source, not hidden, but but relatively unknown data sources like Figshare. Um, definitely worth taking a look at. Oh, and there's also, um, this is datasearch.research.google. Um, it's Google's relatively new. It's been in beta for a while, but it's just launched a couple of months ago, a data set search engine, which is um, super useful. Um, there's some commercial stuff in here, but, but um, you know, you can kind of weed through that. And there are ways to, to exclude it. Um, that's another resource I actually didn't put in here, but um, is definitely worth looking at. Uh, other than that, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have put any, anything in here that isn't useful, but, uh, you know, some of these things just aren't, aren't worth spending time talking about, but I would definitely look at the Paris Agreement NDCs and the Climate Scope API. The Climate Scope API has, for every country, it has a massive amount of data in terms of um, renewable energy capacity, generation, finance, et cetera, and so forth. Um, it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's a major backer. I don't know, if, I can't remember if it's like the UN or World Bank or something like that, but it's 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 a legit site. So I definitely look at that. And uh, just one last point, um, go to questions and answers, corporate register. I mentioned that um, on the last webinar, but it is a great resource. It's a central repository for effectively all, I mean, several hundred thousand, um, companies in the world, it's, it's a, a central repository for their sustainability reports. The GRI database, I think it was called, used to be that, um, but it's being phased out. And this is a great replacement. Uh, it's really, if you're doing research on, you know, more than 15 or 20 companies, it's, it's kind of a pain to go and try to find 15 sustainability reports, particularly when websites are, are inconsistent in terms of navigation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is one central repository. You go in, you put a ticker in, or you do a company search, and you get the sustainability report. The, the, their most recent one, their last three, whatever they, they've submitted. So definitely worth looking at. We can go to questions. I wanted to leave a little extra time at the end. Just um, there, were, there were last time some questions. Um, there were great questions. And um, I want to make sure that I get to them if, if you have some. Absolutely. And thank you very much for this, Kyle. Um, quite, a, quite a bit of uh, info to digest there. It is a lot of data, but just to, to reiterate a point I made up front, um, uh, certainly I didn't go over everything. And, and the point wasn't to overwhelm. It was to kind of give you a feel for what's in this presentation and put you on the road to researching and, and discovering yourself. And you always feel free to contact me if you have questions um, at any time. But really, it was just kind of a, a food for thought kind of thing and a, and a push in different directions to show you various different sources out there. Um, there there's a lot of information out there. You just need to know where to look and, and how, how to pull it down. That's all.
Absolutely. And and it's actually very impressive, the, just the different types of resources and, and just the amount of data that is out there for, for anybody who can, who's willing to, to kind of look into it, basically. Um, so that is really impressive. Um, one attendee asks, a recent Bloomberg article cited impending ESG funds shakedown in view of the Ukraine-Russian conflict. How available is data on any Russian energy or related associations um, on the sources that you mentioned? And do you foresee any significant impact on global ESG funds? Yeah, so th that is a big issue. I mean, it's, it's brought up a number of issues. It, it's brought up sovereign ESG, and that, I did have a couple, couple sovereign ESG links in here, yeah, top left. It's kind of, I mean, sovereign ESG has you know, not been a hot topic ever. I mean, it, to some, it's, it's highly relevant to what they do, but uh, it is a hot topic now. It's it's brought into question the, the question of why why funds weren't divested um, earlier. Obviously, the, the Ukraine invasion was a bit of a surprise, but uh, you know there, there there were issues that the diehard ESG types would, would have said don't own, don't own these companies to begin with. Uh, in terms of data on these companies, um, I you know to be honest with you, I don't. There there are certainly emissions related data and all these major databases. And the, the, I mean, the big, you know, Russian energy companies are in there, the bank BTB or whatever it is, is in there. There's probably in governance under sanctions. I get, I, before I, uh, I said sanctions is a bad word for the database. The database is called open sanctions database. Sanctions is a bad word for the database because it's not just sanctions. There is a lot of information in there in terms of relationships. Um, and I know there's a lot of information in that database pulls from a number of different sources. So if you go to that website, um, the open sanctions database, there's, there's one download link that is everything. And then you can also download the, the, the feeder databases. And there's one feeder database that um, is about relationships and, and oligarchs and major financings and that kind of thing. There's something called the um, corporate mapping project or company mapping project. That is exactly as it sounds, um, and it, it, it maps um, a lot of interrelationships, and including, and I may, may see even with an emphasis on some of the more untoward relationships. So, so the answer to the question, the, the, there is data out there. I'm sure that Russian companies aren't trans, as transparent as companies elsewhere, but I have seen a lot of it. Uh, sanctions database, it's probably harder to come by than you know, for a lot of other countries, but, but there is data out there. And the, the other part of that question was about ESG funds or ESG investing. What was it, Michael? About the impact of Russia on? Uh, any significant impact on global ESG funds? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a number of them have taken, you know, big hits. I mean, billions and billions of dollars. I, prospectively, you know, I think, I mean, a lot of them are indexed. Certainly the ETFs that I'm talking about. So that kind of go, goes back to, you know, the index provider, whether it's MSCI or others, um, and how they treat it. But I, you know, uh, JP Morgan was, I mean, they did it in, in steps, but it ultimately got around to kind of kick Russia out of all its funds. It started with Sovereign and then I think you know, went to a lot of other funds. So, you know, I, I think that funds are going to be less, certainly for a while, less willing to be invested in Russia. And I think that they, to the extent that they, they're active or, or, you know, have some, flexibility in terms of, um, you know, what, changing the index or what index they use that they're, they're going to avoid being invested in Russia, but they're also going to avoid, they're going to take a, a closer look at, at sovereign ESG and sovereign risk. All funds, not just, not just sovereign funds, not just bond funds. I think all funds are going to consider it more. It was amazing how, how heavily a lot of, uh, again, I'm just talking about ETFs that I track, but how heavily a lot of these ETFs were invested in Russia. Uh, again, the, the, the invasion, you know, wasn't necessarily predictable. It came as somewhat of a surprise, but, you know, Russia shouldn't be scoring high on, on ESG and it shouldn't be in, in a lot of these funds, basically. More, so more scrutiny, I guess, is, is what I'm saying. Got it. Thank you for that. Another question is, um, and we'll probably make this one the, the final one as we're uh, running a little bit late, but um, what 
applications do you think uh, these resources are useful for? Uh, I guess the, the attendee uh, asks. And for the inexperienced, where do you suggest that they should start? Um, can you rephrase that? Inter- how do you interpret uh, that, Michael? I would I would say um, I guess what are what would be some some immediate use cases for of, for of, a lot of, of the data? resources? Yes, I mean there are probably a lot of them. Um, you know, up front, what kind of the the, the way I, I, I introed or segued into it was kind of harking back to the last webinar and the sort of passing. It was a little bit more than a passing statement, but it's a brief statement at towards the end after going over you know all the inherent problems with company reported ESG data and how that sort of propagates through the the third party ecosystem of scores and ratings, particularly at the rolled up level when you opinions embedded in weightings and everything like that. There's this trend institutional investors are doing more and more research in house. So I mean, one, you know, they're just investing more and more in, in, in ESG and two, they're kind of moving away from that one size fits all rolled up product. So, that intro, what what is said last time, and, and kind of bring, bringing it up again in the intro, it was in the context of you know using of a kind of feeling empowered using using resources to 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 do it yourself, if you will, you know to do your own research, or if not, do your own research, uh, you know do, do your own, you know if you get it, use third party re- data, third party scores, ratings, rankings, whatever, you know you can use some of this as a, as due diligence, as a sanity check. To, to make sure data jives, et cetera, and so forth. But in terms of applications, I mean, it, it, you know, it could be a lot of things. It could be a company benchmarking study. It could be portfolio reviews. I mean, there's a million different ways you could you could apply it. But it's essentially ESG-related investment research, whether that's using it to actually pick investee companies, using it to do kind of sustainability, climate risk analysis, whatever. There's lots of lots of applications, and it, you know, it depends on. The data we're talking about too within here makes sense. Where do you think the the inexperienced users should start? Depends on what, what, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, it depends on what the research project is, if you will. But I, not knowing the specifics of, of a, a given investor, a given analyst, a given portfolio, a given project. I mean, I would say I would start with. You know the important stuff. Um, I think I addressed the last webinar two or three webinars ago was about materiality, and I know I, I talk about materiality in almost every webinar. It comes up in one way or another. And in the last webinar, kind of exactly how I worded it, but basically I mentioned sector specific. That materiality is very case specific. It's sector specific. It's regional specific. It's even portfolio specific, and security specific. But there are what we could call close to a universal set of, of material metrics. That there are some ESG metrics that are kind of material that every company applies, like greenhouse gas emissions. So I guess the answer is someone beginning, I would start with, you know, the the important stuff, the obvious stuff, um, the the core metrics, if you will. And if you want a perfect example of a set of core metrics um, in the last webinar, and you can, I, I referenced um, Singapore Exchange put out a consultation paper um, with, I think they're calling it a common set of metrics. I call it a core set of metrics. Basically, 27 metrics that are, are of relevance to just about every company, every sector. Um, some more material than others, but, but it's, a, it's a common set of metrics. Um, there's 27 of them, uh, environmental, social, governance. Just Google uh, SGX common ESG metrics consultation paper, and there's a great table in there. Um, but but the, the short answer is don't get bogged down in, in a lot of the, the small stuff like uh, violations tracker and whatever else. Just start with the big stuff. Start with the emissions. Start with, you know, one thing I didn't put in here, probably should have, uh, like if you're doing a, a, a social, uh, so one of the big metrics for the social pillar is employee health and safety, that kind of thing, like occupational uh, health and safety injuries. Injury data is, it, it's relative, right? If you have... Um, a bank, let's say a financial institution, and no matter how many employees they have, if they had 10 deaths in the workplace, you know, that's pretty significant. If you have some industrial company, you know, a shipbuilder, and they have 10 deaths in the year, or well, 10 is a large number, but whatever, five, that's different, right? An industrial deaths or serious injuries in an industrial company is different than a finance company. And 
um, serious industries in a tiny company is different than a giant company. So what, what you could do is you could go to like the Ministry of Manpower and download average uh, fatality rates and serious industry rates by industry and, and you know, compare it to your, you know, your company's own data or, or your peer group's own data. But, but just again, short answer is focus on the big things. Focus, focus on you know, kind of emissions, energy, water for environmental you know, injuries and, and um, human rights and a few other things for social and use that uh, SGX common set of metrics as, as a guide because it's, it's really well done and well thought out. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Kyle, for your insights today. This has been super informative. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, for sharing your questions. And of course, thank you to SGX for collaborating on this webinar. If you want to engage Kyle for a bespoke research requests, you can uh, contact your smart carbon account manager. They will make sure uh, to uh, put you in touch. Uh, and you can also follow Kyle's profile on Smart Karma so you don't miss any of his insights. Uh, and for any other questions or comments that you have, you can always email us at research at smartkarma.com. Uh, Kyle, thank you very much once again. Yeah, and feel, you know, feel free if you have any questions. I know there's a lot to cover here. If you have any questions, feel free. I love talking about this stuff. Just contact me in the world. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.